So now you've heard Claire's talk to the Swinton Circle on conservatism and nationalism, now RadioFreeUK.org, on the 67th Weekly Friday Show, present the question and answer session. So if you listen in, you may get some answers to your own questions. If you have more questions, I'm sure Claire would be very pleased to answer them. She's available on Twitter, she has her own blog, or you can comment against this item on any one of our platforms. But now over to Claire and a question and answer session on her talk, Conservatism and Nationalism. Okay, you can move on to questions if you want now. Any questions at all? Daniel? Yeah. Almost all our political parties are led by women. Where are they? <coughs> well, well, I blame the men. You allowed it to happen. You just let it happen. And then you say, oh, well, the women have taken over. There's nothing we can do now. Men are sick, though, aren't they? Well, there is the weaker sex, and there's the even weaker sex, it would appear. We're the strongest. Yes. We've still got Jeremy Corbyn. Living home. I'll leave it Can I just ask a question relating to the very beginning of your speech? Mm-hmm. Um, you described nationalism, which you know, was something that could be equated almost with conservatism. Mm-hmm. Um, if I may say, I disagree with that. Uh, I think nationalism as a political philosophy has its root in both the left and the right. And for example, if you apply that view to certain issues of policy making, you could well argue, and certainly in my opinion, and not my opinion, means uh, a great deal, but it is my opinion that, for instance, the pri- privatization the utilities uh, is something that should never have happened because you should not, in principle, be able to make a profit out of water or gas or electricity. All these things should be in public hands. The so same so. thing, in my opinion, uh, with the railways. I think there's a very, well, certainly a strong debatable mm-hmm. argument of taking the railways back into public ownership. Now, if you do those sort of things, the, the, the roots of those arguments lie basically in socialism. Now, I know it's Close I, 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 I know it's uh, it, it's an unwise thing to say, but I'm going to say it, and it doesn't mean to say that I'm equated with the Nazis because I'm not. I am a sort of national socialist. Uh, a lot of my views are based on. Um, certain issues of socialism, Mm -hmm. as well as the profit motive in conservatism. But the national idea of putting the nation first, of patriotism, Mm -hmm. which nationalism is a political expression of patriotism. Yes. Nationalism is really a combination of both left and right ideologies. Yes. I, I think that is that should be better understood. Yes, I, I don't think that there's anything in, in conservatism that says you have to sell off your public utilities. I think it was just a, the attempt of Thatcher to gerrymander the, the vote because he, she, she had to, set, to give the, the... Well, she was targeting the lower middle classes in, in order and to, to give them all these goodies so they'll always vote Tory. And she did succeed at that, that level uh, by selling off council houses and things. Um, so that worked for her, but, but this idea seemed to have um, um, spread throughout the world um, because, of course, it is always um, um, uh, attractive to, to sell off things in order to, you know, get, you know, you know, get what you want um, because there, there appear to be no consequences. But um, you did that with the monasteries, for example. Yeah, oh yes, of course, that's such a good point, Tim. Yes. That was yes. The yes, Richard. Yes, um, one thing I'd like to point out is this dichotomy between um, <coughs> socialism and nationalism is a relatively recent invention in Europe and the United States. Mm-hmm. Um, whenever you've seen uh, socialism triumph, for instance, Stalin was probably nearly as much a nationalist as he was a socialist. Uh, so was Mao, so was Ceausescu, mm-hmm. when all these, these people were absolute monsters. But nevertheless, they were successful by marrying socialism and nationalism. Now, the socialism we have in the West, which is not really socialism, has lost faith in public ownership and in anything really, and is anti-nationalistic, 
uh, has not achieved any socialist aim, whatever. So it's, it's achieved nothing but failure for itself. Whenever socialism has been successful, it has been connected to some degree with nationalism. There's no private enterprise under Mao or Stalin. Mm. Um, no, I, I didn't say he wasn't a socialist. I said he was also a nationalist. Yes. Yeah, so that, that's a good point. Thank you. Gareth? Uh, I'd say Sam's point, but selling off national assets isn't conservatism. No, I, I didn't. They say fair liberalism. Yeah. The yeah. point about nationalism in Britain is it meets conservatism because there is no British race as such. We are a, a nation of four kindred peoples, English, Scottish, Northern Irish and Welsh. Mm -hmm. Nationalism in Britain is civic nationalism, which is loyalty to shared institutions, the principal one of which is the monarchy, the second one is the Protestant religion, and the third one is parliamentary democracy. That defines us as a nation. I would say that's essentially national conservatism. Yes, yes. but, but the, the, the attempt by Hitler, I mean, what he did when he he, um, he joined the, the, the German Labour Party because he thought, well, if he's going to have a career in politics, the Labour Party would be the one that would get the most people because there are always more, more workers than our middle class people. Um, so, um, and of course, um, I think he was trying to get the, the best of socialism and the best of nationalism and, and then he called it national socialism and that was it. Of course the anti-Semitism bit was the extra bit but then I, I, I would say um, anti-Semitism is, is sort of pretty well established all over Christian Europe anyway and um, you know um, uh, if you've read Merchant of Venice or, or Fiddler on the Roof um, um, we, we know um, um, what sort of thing went on in those times, um, but 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 the thing is, is you know, the national interest is sort of almost sort of almost predictable in that you know, in in, in the Philippines, um, no foreigner can get to buy any property um, unless they had a Filipino partner, a co Filipino co-owner. So so I suppose that that's a way they keep their property prices under their control. Um, so, so foreigners don't just sort of go in and, and, and um, um, keep the prices um, so high that the locals can't afford to buy anymore, um, the way um, our government doesn't seem to care about that sort of thing. Um, but I suppose in, in theory all these things can be reversed, um, except that, you know, it, it, it seems, um, well, uh, very difficult to see how it's going to happen when, when no, no one in in politics is prepared to admit any mistake. That they're not, well I can't see them sort of even admitting that, 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 that they've made any mistakes at all. Um, certainly the selling off of council houses, I mean they, they weren't built to be sold off, they were built to house the, the urban poor. And um, um, if you sell them off then well, I mean, you're not using it for the right reasons, in the same way that you know you're not using marriage for the right reasons if you give it to gay people, because they're you know they're not interested in rearing the next generation. I mean, marriage was, after all, for the purpose of of rearing the next generation, um, and, and and really it wasn't even a romantic thing. It was all about, you know, property between families and, and passing down property through through the generations. Um, and um, we know that, you know, in, in previous times and previous generations, um, nobody thought that much about, you know, the romance of it. It, it wasn't a day of romance. Um, you know, one, one was just betrothed in, in childhood because it was, you know, it was some dynastic alliance or something. Um, and um, I, I, it's possible that the Romantic movement um, may have been the, the, the cause of <laughs> um, the, the downfall of Western civilization. There's this, you know, there's this deliberate emotionalizing of, of everything and, um, and, and making you know, emotion um, the, um, the most important thing of existence. Um, um, it's it's difficult to sort of go back to to you know reason and and, and looking at you know the reasons for things um, 
you know, with conservatism, it, it's not even properly defined, um, nor socialism. Um, if you go to the um, Conservative Party um, constitution, you will find references to, co to the principles of the Conservative Party, but no listing of those principles at all. That's because it hasn't got yeah. it. Well, well, we, we, I, the problem in this country is there is no genuine Conservative Party. It has the Conservative to be Party has its stance, so it is not Conservative the nearest to it, you know. Mrs. Thatcher, I would just be like, made a terrible blunder when she decided to pass the Housing Homeless Persons Act and the Housing Act of, of 1988. She said this was in accord with the idea of a property owning democracy. Well, of course, she never considered was that it would lead to a massive shortage of social housing, some of which we are seen today by uh, uh, not allowing local authorities to use the receipts from the sale of council houses to construct more social housing. Now that would have been a nationalist ideal because you'd be serving the people. What was Mrs. Thatcher and the people around her, particularly Sir Keith Joseph, who in fact, I mean, he was a fine man in many ways, but he was a liberal. Well, well, what he wanted was he wanted to see the service of the property and democracy. And the best way that could be done, in his view, was to minimize the value of local authorities. Mm. Uh, I, I don't see that, uh, uh, that it could possibly be argued in Mr. Thatcher's time that the Conservative Party had any nationalistic ideas at all. No. And she repeatedly voted against sanctions. Well, I remember Harold Macmillan. And 101 other things. Yeah, okay, Harold think. Macmillan did, did um, accuse her of selling off the family silver, didn't he? I, I don't know it was uh, what exactly he was referring to, but, but she was certainly selling a lot of, a lot of um, national assets off. Um, well, but to the extent that, that um, um, Tony Blair had to promise that he wouldn't just go and renationalize everything if he came to power, and, and that was what the, the clause four was um, the, the, the Labour Party split about clause four was about in 1995. Yes. Okay, Chris Watts. Oh, sorry. Uh, sorry. 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 I take Chris Watts. Okay. Yes. I didn't see your hands. So okay. I will take Chris Watts, please. Yeah. You had your hand up, Chris. Yeah. Sorry, apologies again for my lateness. So you've probably covered this already earlier in your talk. But we, no doubt you've gone through a whole range of threats that we face now to Western civilization. Um, can we undo some of this realistically in the, you know, in the light of political correctness, which I see as the biggest threat to, to Western civilization? Um. Well, only if we're prepared to, to defy them and say, look, I, I'll say all these politically incorrect things, you must do your worst. It's only pre you know, really being prepared to say that and, and perhaps lose our jobs, lose our contracts. I, I, there is no easy way of doing it, is there? No. I mean, I mean what we've seen from the examples of these well, Muslim radicals, they're, they're not afraid and, and we, we have to be as fearless as, as they, they are. Or, or we won't get anywhere, will perhaps we? Perhaps a leader who will be fearless may appear in America, perhaps. <laughs> yes. so. There's an answer to that, just on that, I'll be very quick. There's an answer to that, which is that we know in this country, you know, we have books written about it, <coughs> recently by a woman called Innes Bowen, called From Medina to Birmingham. 50% of the mosques in this country, the latest count is 1,790 mosques in Britain. 50% of those mosques are controlled by extreme conservative um, ideas of Islam, by the Wahhabis, the Salafis, the Deobandis. And in those mosques, they talk about kuffars. You're a kuffar, I'm a kuffar. You're an infidel, I'm an infidel because we're not Muslims. There's an answer to these people, which any government with guts would do and say to hell with the consequences, and that is to close down those mosques, the 50% of them, 
that are spouting this nonsense against our own people. I'm and sure that the all these spies would have a good The failure to do this is a sign of chronic weakness which will lead us to disaster. So there, there are things that can be done. Uh, what is, what cannot be done is to imbue people like Mrs. May, who is a disastrous Home Secretary. I'll give her time to see what she can do. But to get into the head of this woman, that we don't want talk, we want action. To pull them all down and build. Okay. Is there a question from Rob? There was a question over there. Yes, sorry, Mr. You're talking about with, that's all right, with the politicians getting them to stand up. The trouble is, everybody has been re educated. All the young people, all the middle class. It's cultural Marxism. That it is political correctness. And it will change, I think and will come from the working class for when our, our, our whole culture starts to slide. And um, we can't afford things anymore. People won't be able to afford to have these political belief systems anymore. Mm -hmm. um, and once the Muslims start getting, uh, because the thing is the police protect the Muslims, and they protect the social justice warriors, which are the extreme left-wing people, but they, they, they protect the Black Lives Matter, who are sort of the most racist thing that there is around certainly makes the KKK, they, they were, uh, once were powerful, they're now, they're now gone. But it'll be, it's, the government won't do it because the people don't have the will yet, because things haven't got bad enough. And when it does, I think, that's when people will start waking up. And since Brexit, uh, we've seen in public, in public speaking, people are changing. And it's scaring a lot of people. Like, this is what I think. I don't think the government's going to do anything because they're not affected. Yeah, but we're not allowed to say anything, are we? Is there any possibility, like may I ask, is there any possibility regarding mosques, any possibility a future government might do to the mosques what Henry VIII did to the monasteries? Yeah. Uh, one way of raising a lot of funds, mm. yeah. oh, dealing yes. with the national debt. Yes. But they don't seem to be very valuable buildings, sadly. <laughs> you could be so rough for housing, cut through the house. So I wanted um, if I could ask you now about immigration. Now it seems to me that our immigration policy has been, I think the polite way, the polite description would be piecemeal. Um, sometimes I think we have no immigration policy except to just let everyone in. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And this is manifesting itself in some very, very unpleasant uh, characteristics. For example, I do not believe that there was ever an endemic problem in this country with corruption. Uh, I mean, cor cor corruption in you know, the smallest um, you know, sense of, of the word um, we now have a problem with corruption, which we see, you know, in the way that certain East London East London boroughs have conducted their, um, you know, their voting affairs. Mm -hmm. um, I just wonder whether you see any hope uh, post Brexit that we can that we can that we really can bring, um, you know, immigration. Uh, under control, and more importantly, teach traditional British values? Well, I don't know. I don't know if there is the will to do it. We can, you know, sit here and talk about these things, um, but, but, but do people outside this room um, care about it? I, I don't know. I mean, it, it just seems so... Do, do you can't even talk about it? That, that, that's the closest party that we can think of. Well, they don't talk about these things, do they? They, they? they seem to want to play safe, and, and there's Diane James. We don't know the ne their new leader, and we don't know what um, what they're going to say. Um, so, I mean, you, well, sorry, we, but you yes. are not conservatives. They go on gay pride marches and things like this. But I can't yes. see how you can be serious of conservatives, are you? Well, well, I mean, it seems that you know, although there are lots of complaints about the Muslims, it's like it's really the Muslims who who seem to, you know, who who some principles um, would would be more or less something 
well, not, not the corruption bit, of course, but, you know, the, the family and marriage and that kind of thing, um, that, 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 you know, because they are social conservatives. And they and reject Christianity. Yeah. They reject it. This is a Christian country. Yes, but, but if, if, if there are not enough Christians to go to church, then... Um, if we challenge the Muslims, they'll be um, violent within seconds if they think they're master of their way of life, even if they're living in Luton. And they know that. And in a way, our country's been cuckolded, just as many through extreme mm. feminism, our men have been. Mm. And it's not, I'm not, um, uh, it's, I always say uh, feminism, uh, sorry, women are people like men. Feminism is an ideology and it's a Marxist, cultural Marxist ideology. And Marx was saying in the late 1800s about the breakup of the family is communism. And people don't realize what it is. It's all connected. And um, it came from, you know, the American universities, the long march through the institutions, mm -hmm. re-educating re 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 the young. Yes. And this is what's happened, and the will isn't there yet. But when things change and things get harsh, um, it will. And unfortunately, we've had, um, I think, immigration, I don't think it's a bad thing. I don't think you have to be uh, white to be British. But these people are colonizing Britain, and they, 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 they are not acknowledging that Britain is yes, a country. So they, they see weakness and they exploit it. Oh, yeah. Mm. It's because we've been, we're, we're weak, we've been cuckolded. That's what I think. The UKIP has no ideology. If, if they fail now, it will because, be because Farage and other people in the UK reject any notion of nationalism. That is why they, despite a certain person, uh, namely myself, writing numerous letters to them, um, saying that they should seek alliances with the Front National in France and the other nationalist parties in Europe, they refuse to do so. Because they're non ideological. Well, the, 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 the corpus, aren't they? Richard, did you have a question? Yes, this is, um, <clears throat> this is almost off topic, but very interesting anyway. Mm -hmm. uh, you were talking earlier on about who outside the stream is interested in the old traditions, the old bits, and actually work very well. Occasionally, I write about it on my, my blog, and I find there's an enormous amount of interest in these issues in Russia, of all places. Mm -hmm. because they feel they've had their soul stolen from them through yes. the socialist experience yes. and are trying to seek it wherever they may. Mm. Yes. Well, you know, foreigners like this idea of a bygone Britain, you know, stately homes and people in Victorian dress and all that kind of thing. So, so it certainly, you know, sells to the tourists and um, I don't know, but, but it has to be sort of organic and real, not, you know, a show that you put on just to... But, but I don't know, I, you know, there are always new traditions as the, the old ones die away and um, we, we just have to see what it's going to be. Yes, Tim. May I ask a question about national, just want to put a question to you, about national solidarity. Now, last year I went on a cruise to Baltic and we had some excellent speakers on board. One speaker was a man, a diplomat, British diplomat, who had previously been a retired. He had been ambassador to Norway. And so he knew a great deal about Scandinavian countries and was a big And it is well known, we all know, but in Scandinavia, they have this fantastic welfare state that looks after so much and looks after everybody from cradle to the grave. And he explained that this is the belief, the great uh, Scandinavian belief in this uh, national solidarity and um, uh, working hard but providing for those who are less fortunate amongst your country um, is beginning to crack. And then he said, previously, it was absolutely uh, central to the, the Scandinavian experience, but the belief in it is now beginning to crack. And he said the reason is because they, and because previously, when he first went to Scandinavia as a diplomat, they were one tribe, and it was quite clear what he was saying. But very interesting that mm -hmm. a man who had been a, Her Majesty's ambassador to Norway. Mm -hmm. should be so bold as to openly say, to draw attention to the fact that the population there was no longer one tribe. Now would you feel that the type of uh, benefit system that they get in Scandinavia or have elsewhere, the welfare system, is 
uh, uh, likely to be connected with national solidarity and therefore perhaps to um, receive less public support once that situation no longer exists as it did previously. Well, I, I, I think um, people have been saying for a while that the welfare state causes a family to break up because um, people think, well, I don't have to put up with my horrible family, horrible husband, horrible, you know, whatever. I'm going out, I'm, I'm moving out, and I, the, the, you know, the government will provide me with a flat if I'm pregnant and unmarried and so on and so forth. So, so the government and the taxpayer, of course, funds this sort of you know, family breakdown. But yeah. sadly, um, I think what we all agreed on is it seems to be that the, the welfare state is sacred and nothing must happen to it. This is what the right and left seem to agree on. And, and so this, um, you know, this monster carries on, destroying our lives and our family and, and our traditions um, because we, we feel we can't do without it. Yes. Michael. I was going to say, um, that's the, uh, the left wing it does not represent the working class. And whenever I hear nationalists saying, um, oh, our forefathers didn't fight for this, we should also be saying, our, um, our working class ancestors did not go on strike for this. Our working class, you know, the miners, they didn't go on strike for gay marriage, they didn't go on strike for uh, mass immigration, they didn't go on strike for thought control. They didn't go on strike for um, welfareism for single mothers. No, they went on strike for jobs. They went on strike for best the conditions. Wages. And they went on strike for pensions. Those are the values of the working class, yes. which the left does not represent. It represents the values of the low-life vermin you find on a university campus who just come up with moral relativist, nihilistic rubbish. <laughs> <laughs> so there you are. I have one, one final one? Yeah, one final question. question yeah. oh. Then I'll do yeah. a vote of thanks. Yeah. Um, uh, when you're looking at welfare, I think the guinea pig uh, that the welfare was was actually the black community in America. And when they used to marry the black people, it was the welfare that utterly, totally destroyed mm. their culture. And um, if you've heard of the economist Thomas Sowell, he talks about that. He came out of poverty, and he's, a, he's in the 70s, he's a top, top economist. He's always been against um, what the welfare has done to black people. And he talks about, like, with the minimum wage. He says it destroys people, because he says if you're flipping burgers and in January, it doesn't mean you're going to be doing it in December. And he mm -hmm. says they actually, no one can afford to pay, employ so many people. Mm -hmm. And it actually seems wrong to what you'd think. You'd think, well, people should have a basic living wage. But what it means is that people can't employ as many people. And the black communities in America are utterly yes. destroyed. So in, 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 in the cities, you've got um, uh, was it, uh, slurs in black con cultures, mm -hmm. which just are, are appalling uh, for the people who are in them. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and I think that's what welfare can do. Yes. Well, people. welfare means a big state. So, you know, really, we, we don't need a big state if we have our families and our extended families intact. But then we, we will have to suffer the inconvenience of putting up with them. Um, so, you know, um, yes. Oh. I just think the welfare state has changed its form in the sense that in the past people were expected to pay in before they take out, and that idea has gradually been lost. Mm. Um, we're also, it's also not a very good idea to have a welfare state which lets in unlimited immigrants. So anyone can come into the country and take out when they have to put in. Yeah. You yeah. can change the welfare state back to your, well, providing a sort of minimum cover yes. and uh, making sure you get contributions. Yes. Yeah. 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 A more contributive welfare state, I quite agree. Yeah. Mm. Yes. yes. Very good. If there's no more questions, Daniel, okay, good. Okay. Um, Gareth mentioned the, the institutions that uh, people adhere to. Uh, uh, they've been destroyed, they've been corroded by uh, individualism and nihilism. There is nothing to assimilate to. Mm -hmm. But this corrosion is happening globally, so though the Muslims are perceived as the, the great enemy, in fact, they've been corroded as well. Obviously, the radicals are doing their best to fight back. Surely the only two states with the mass to resist this global corrosion is Russia and China. And only when Russia or China, either one, uh, supplant the USA as the global power will, will this change, this whole system start to change. Well, that, that seems to be 
that would take too long and I would hate to have all these things happening long, long, long after I'm dead. And, and therefore, um, I, I would like that, that there to be a more immediate way of doing things. And, and I suppose um, we, we owe it to ourselves, really, to, to point out what the problems are and, and to, to say what they are. And, and if the problem seems to be um, the corrosion of marriage, stopping us from passing on our traditions and our knowledge and our wisdom um, to, to the next generation, then, then surely we can all ask for the institution of marriage to be better respected. Um, but I suspect people won't do that because it, it, I think that they feel they're out on a limb and you know but people don't really get it and it's very difficult to explain um, the consequences are not immediate um, and then we're, we're, we're likely to be mocked just for mentioning the subject um, I mean I don't think China chi China's having a lot of divorces and so you know Russia Russia too and, and that may be to do with a lack of religion or, or the lack of laws that support marriage. Um, so, you know, if there are no consequences to, to walking out on your spouse, um, then people will do it because, you know, they get bored and they're irritated and they think they can do better and they're often encouraged to, to think they can do better. Um, often they don't. I have plenty of um, female friends who, who left their husbands and, um, and, and, t and took up with men that I thought were, were lesser men than their husbands, but it's too late by then. Um, so I, I don't know. I mean, I mean, the whole culture has to change and therefore the law has to change and we have to be able to persuade um, the politicians now or, or put these ideas to them or oh, perhaps write a book and you know, they'll read it. I mean, will they read it? I don't think they, they will read anything that, um, or, or will vote for anything because the, 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 they have very little power when you think about it. You know, our, our MPs have, have even less free speech than we do. If you think about it, if they say anything wrong, um, um, the media are, are on to them and they're mocked and then they're demoted and, you know, sacked from the cabinet or whatever. So, so they're not going to stick their necks out for us if, if it, it means you know, uh, suffering you know, any, any financial um, um, uh, loss or, 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 or loss of position. So, so actually I don't think our MPs have enough rights. That's why they won't stand up for anything because they don't see it as worth a candle. And then we'll just be taken over by, well, who knows? Media slaps them down, don't they? Yeah. Um, can I say, I think most, most of the public in Britain and the West are too comfortable. And we're obsessed with entertainment. We don't talk politics. And when we're less comfortable, you're going to start people talking about the real world. We, um, we can afford to have all these ideologies like uh, feminism and, and, and all this other sort of stuff, but in reality, you know, and men and women, marriage was a contract and it was one we survived. We don't have that now because we're too rich, um, or we think we're too rich. Um, I mean, we, we could talk about um, abolishing no fault divorce, but it, it won't get anywhere because nobody cares. You see, I mean, I, I say it all the time, but nobody gets it. Or, or, or people are already divorced, so you say, well, what, what do you expect me to do about it then? You know, um, so, you know, all the bad stuff has already happened, and most people have had the, the stuffing knocked out of them. Um, and and, and our, we know our MPs are, are so weak and powerless that they're not, you know, they're just happy to be in the same position five years from now, and, and, and they will, you know, be very careful not to say anything that might annoy anyone. So... Don't you think the internet has had some say in this? I mean, it strikes me as being positively appalling that there is seem to be no control over terrorists putting their material on the internet, uh, pornographers putting pornography into the internet and corrupting tens of thousands of young children. I mean, I know I am a technophobe, I, I very much regret the advent of the internet. I very much regret um, uh, the, the email texting. I very much regret uh, the ability of people to have mobile telephones. I think all this thing is a complete disaster 
uh, civilization. I mean it quite seriously. Well, we should I break think, all the spindles in the land and go to sleep for 100 cool. years. I think everything to do with modernism <laughs> is, is ruining this country. Yeah. And it, it's ruining it very, very fast. <laughs> That's what Hillary mobile. did. <laughs> never used a mobile. I've never sent an email. <laughs> Never will be. <laughs> I think we are where we are with the internet and the mobile for me. But why can't we stop terrorists? We know what, what the government did to the Luddites, Sam. Uh, right. They hang them. I know I'm exceptional in that regard, but why cannot we, st can we not stop terrorists from posting uh, appalling material or pornographers for corrupting people? Uh, it is shocking some of the things that can go on the internet. Mm. I mean, my daughter has so got two young children. She has to be very careful as to what, what, what they see and what they don't see. <laughs> and every day, if you get a train today, I my train car to London, you see 20 people sitting in a row, not one of them reading a book, not one of them reading a newspaper, all of them pressing buttons to get into their thick heads completely unimportant things, such as where did my friend uh, go and have her hair cut or something. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 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 the very fact, last point, the very fact that David Cameron thought it suitable uh, to give his wife's hairstylist an honour just about sums up the state of this country. Yeah, well, very glad to be of David Cameron. Sorry. <laughs> David <laughs> Cameron was <laughs> determined to trash what remained his own reputation. Yeah, do we have any more questions for Claire? Do you see we have a couple of Ravens and then I'll... What's your surname? My name is Rod Lonsdale. Mr. Lonsdale, okay. Yeah. Yeah, Rod, uh, Raven and then Mr. Lonsdale. Ravens, do you have a question? Um, oh. oh. Yeah. Are we becoming a secular state? A what's the secular. A sacrum state. Secular. 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 I mean, we have um, um, bishops in the House of Lords, but, but really all they do is, is, is go along with, with what the government wants anyway. So, so they're not even... Or, or if they don't, they're just being, you know, very lefty in Labour, because, um, um, yes, Anglican clergymen are, are usually that way, aren't they? I, I think there's only one Conservative bishop, and that's Richard Charters. And um, he's not doing much these days, is he? My question is, is the church now... Christian or is the, is the church secular? Secular. It's Christian. liberal. Secular. Right. No, modern, modern technology is antisocial and insular. And in cities it is. And it's uh, it is antisocial. It's very rude a lot of it. It's very rude. But one of the things that needs to people um, is an important thing to realise is if they actually do control the internet they're going to actually stop a lot of free speech. Yeah. And the thing is, there is, um, uh, listening to the BBC, all that left-wing bullshit, everything we get from from the uh, from our people in Parliament, everything else, the thing is that there is an alternative movement where they're actually telling the truth. They will tell you about Hillary Clinton's uh, criminal background. You don't hear about it from anywhere else. And I know it's very frustrating for people who are not online and who never will be. But the, the, that is one thing that is a saviour, is the fact that we can actually speak about what a lot of these people are really doing. Because mm. they control the other media. And unfortunately, newspapers are dying. People aren't watching TV. Children are watching screens on their phone, not watching telly. Mm. And yes, young people are watching porn from the ages of seven or so. Shopping. Mm. Uh, it is shopping. But, but there is, it is all not doom and gloom. There, uh, one of our hopes is in the fact that we actually can talk about things honestly. Uh, that's what I think. Mm -hmm. Yes. You can. Okay. Oh, sorry. What's your name? My name is John. Is it? I'm just saying that a government can get hold of the internet in a particular country and eliminate things like extreme porn or. Well, it's, it's, it, yes. It, I mean, they can block certain websites, can't they? Um, I mean, they already have the technology. They're just feeling a bit shy of doing that because of their, you know, the free speech, free expression thingy that they 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 feel they have to 
pay lip service to. Gosh, that's down, unfortunately. They'll shut down anyone who says anything they don't like, which will be yeah, years. Yes. 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 Yes.